Good morning. <laughs> oh. I'd love to hear that chatter, though. I'm, I'm going to have to be honest with you. I'd love to hear that fellowship before we get started and everybody's checking on everybody, see how everybody's doing. It's, a, it's awesome to hear that, that fellowship. I don't call it really chatter. I call it fellowship. And it's, it's awesome to be able to hear that and hear that brothers and sisters are talking and having fun and, and uh, discussing things that's going on with, with their family even. You know, find out how, how's everybody doing and all this kind of things that's going on like that. Um, still want to remember Rick gets all the, Richard, Richard gets all the attention when we first start this morning because that's, you know, that's like a who's who type thing that's in his family that's where everything's going on. How's your neck doing anyway? Is it still about the same? Yeah, I, well, that's kind of good. <laughs> it, it pretty much always hurts, it's, but it's good, always good to have your neck, you know, with you, not, not to leave it at home and stuff like that, because that's not good. But we do want to continue to remember Rick. He's had that cancer on the esophagus, and I, at least it's not inside of him, it's on the outside, and... Uh, so, uh, did he go? When does he go? Yeah. Yeah, okay, Tuesday. I, yeah, I, it's kind of like a consolation or consultation rather than a consolation. He don't get no consolation prizes for that, but he does get a consultation on kind of what they're going to, well, they know what they're going to do, but how, you know, when they're going to schedule it and all that. And continue to remember Chris and uh, Richard's other son and then the, the uh, daughter-in-law, Amy, and... Yeah, and Cheryl Reed. And so continue to remember Rich, Richard's family. And uh, like I said, it's kind of like roll call there. And you said Miss Emma is, is doing better, right? Emma, well, and your, your mother's doing better and hopefully will be here today. All right, and Miss uh, Miss Alma, that she gets to just to have therapy. And I guess that's better than surgery, but I I'm, I wouldn't be like looking forward to shoulder <laughs> physical therapy because that's pretty rough. I've had hip replacement, and that wasn't nothing. I've had a some work done on my knee, and that wasn't nothing in rehab, but I heard that shoulder's pretty rough. So, um, <laughs> no. Okay, what at the bottom end of it, who is it? Okay. okay, Roger Bennett's brother needs our prayers. He went to visit somebody that was sick and then got sick. Right. So we need to remember them. Remember also that uh, Philip gets to go home. Is it Thursday? You said probably Thursday. So we want to pray.
primarily that he can do enough and do his physical therapy enough that it won't be a burden on Gwen. And so we need to continue to remember uh, the family there. Uh, let's see, who we got? Oh, Miss Ruby Phillips, she's, uh, she doesn't need any calls or visits at this time, but prayers, cards, and things like that would be good. Carolyn just keeps getting better, I reckon. So that's. All right, so Carolyn goes tomorrow for her checkup, but she's. She seems like she's on top of the world looking down on creation right now. So. Thank you, God. Amen. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's awesome that the, at the card ministry and the prayers and things that goes up from here at this church. Uh, Carol Hill, she's suffering with strep throat and the flu. That's a, not a great combination. A lot of you may know Jerry Sperlin. He's the elder at uh, Beltline, I mean at Decatur Church of Christ, and he's in a hospital with several blood clots. And so we're going to, um, I'm going to move back one. And, and so we need, he sings with uh, Danny with, and the Melody Makers too, so. Um, Yeah. Yeah, they them they could travel and you don't they don't you don't want them traveling, that's for sure. Um, anybody else? I Beverly went to the spine doctor Wednesday and uh, they We'll do probably all the surgeries on her neck and middle back and lower back. But he said there is no reason why she should be hurting the way she's hurting from what they see on the MRI. He said that it's something else is going on. So they're going to run that dye in the spine, put that uh, dye in the spine and look at it and see if there's something going on with nerves or something. It's, there's something else going on that they can't see uh, for her to be hurting like she's hurting. So uh, continue to remember her in her prayers. Thanks for the cards. Thanks for the prayers that's going up. Appreciate it uh, a lot. And we want to get her back to somewhat normal so we can, so I can, don't have to cook and clean and do all. <laughs> uh, all right, anything, anybody else <coughs> got anything? Okay, uh, Zach and Scott, bring you the mic. If Zach, you know, uh, lead our opening prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here today. Father, we're so thankful to study more of your word. And Father, we pray that we'll put it in our hearts and minds so that we'll be drawn closer to you. Father, there are those that have been mentioned that are sick and that are hurting in pain. Father, we pray that you will be with them and comfort them. Father, we pray for the doctors and nurses that care over them, take care of them. We pray that uh, they'll be strengthened and their health will be brought back. Father, we're so thankful for Jesus and what he did to die on the cross for our sins. Father, we pray that as we study your word, that we will uh, be encouraged, we'll be uplifted, and that we'll be closer drawn to you. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, this chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, is those who profess religion ought especially to govern their tongues. And this is still a connection to what really to chapter 1 and chapter 2 uh, because this is talk, talking about doing. Don't just hear stuff and do it. If you're going to say that you're a Christian, then live it out. 
And basically, and specifically in chapter 3, he's dealing basically with the tongues. But it's still that idea, is it live or is it memorex? So is you, do you have genuine, real faith, and are, are you just playing, kind of having faith, like you're having faith? Because if you are, if you're just, if you really have that genuine faith, then you're going to look at it after your tongue. You're going to act, you're going to do some self-control. Um, and I guess, probably everybody knows what happened yesterday, but I'm going to guess somehow or another, ultimately, the, what starts it all is a rhetoric of some kind. Somebody's saying something and then somebody don't buy into that and then then you, you get that. Or it could be just hate, but who knows. But uh, the, main, the main thing is we don't want to say things to get people all upset and, and things like yesterday is an evidence of what the tongue can do. Uh, it can, it can uh, get you killed. It can split families, it can split churches, it can do all these things and uh, and we'll we'll get into it a little more deeper detail in just a minute. And um, in our first verse it says, My brethren, not, not, not many of you become teachers knowing that you shall receive a stricter judgment. I, I enlarged these things and it still looks pretty small up there. Uh, this idea of that faith that, that we've talked about again in, in chap, in, here in chapter 3, and real faith means you're going to live in a way that a child of God should live. And that this includes having self-control over, over your, your speech and over your tongue. Uh, he starts out and he addresses this, my brethren, and again this has two ways uh, that he kind of means it. My brethren, one is your fellow Jews. Um, but the primary way that he means this is my brethren is my fellow Christians. And so why do you think that he would say, let not many of you become teachers? Uh, that, uh, that seems contradictory sometimes, but th there's a reason for that. But let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, which is on the screen now. If you, He says, For both by this time you ought to be teachers, and you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who practices or who partakes only a milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Huh? Five twelve. What did I what I say? What oh, it is yeah, it is Hebrews 5.12. <laughs> That's what it is. I, I don't know what I, I don't know what I wrote, but that's, it is Hebrews 5.12. But what does the writer of Hebrews here say? For you ought to be what? Teachers. Teachers. There's a time and a place when in your Christian maturity that at some point you should be teaching or be able to teach anyway. And you don't, you don't need to be a baby forever. You know, we need, there's some growth that's got to take place or should take place. And so isn't it kind of funny that here James says, don't be many of you teachers, yet there's a time and a point that our maturity should lead us to be able to teach others and to have that teaching profession Too many times you're teaching the wrong thing, and that's what's going on today. 
to a lot of people. That is, that's very, very important. That There's two things here. One, that you ought to be able to be teachers after you've been in, in the church for a while. That don't mean you have to teach, you know, stand up in front of somebody and, and teach. But what it does mean is you should have a maturity level here. You should be moving up and not just standing still, Scott. Yeah, public teaching in the church is meant. God wants that done. We have to. If, if we don't teach, how are people going to learn? It's like a, a mother teaching a child. If, if they don't teach, the child's not going to learn. So it, it has to be, um, but it's at a greater condemnation, if you will, because it's very easy to lead people astray. And mm -hmm. then you've got souls uh, at hand at that so you have to be careful there's a stricter judgment and like you said it's the qualification you need to have enough meat in you you need to have enough knowledge in you to be able to teach and teach the word the right word that that's one of, that's kind of my point and that's the author of Hebrews which most everybody I believe thinks that it's Paul his point is that yeah, we need teachers, but and you should grow at that point. If if you got a baby that doesn't, that's not maturing and it's not growing and he's way behind everything he's going, you're gonna carry him to the doctor. You're gonna find out what's wrong. But spiritually, when we don't when we don't grow, we don't we don't seem too concerned about our own growth and our own uh, spirit. You know, we need. There's a point in time where we need to be developed and get away just from the first principles. And if we're not there, then we need to take a look at ourselves and look at our lives and see why. Because obviously the answer is, is we're not studying. We're not getting in, in the Bible. Scott, Henry's got something. Took, took me years to be able to get up in front of a crowd and teach. But even before them, I knew enough about the Bible to teach individually. Mm -hmm. Big difference between teaching individually and then teaching before a crowd. So we may never uh, get where we can get up and stand up in a crowd and teach before, before an audience like you. But we can if we study our Bibles, we know enough to teach individually. We can teach our family, we can teach our friends, we can teach those we work with. And uh, I did that for years before I could ever get up and teach a class. Yeah, that's, that's the thing about it is it's not, and again, we're not talking about necessarily that you're getting up here, but you need to be able to mature enough that you can share God's word with them. Yes. As you look in a, a you look in Ephesians four where it talks about that as being one of the yeah the that's gifts. where we're going now. Okay, and First Corinthians twelve as well. First Corinthians twelve when it talks about the different gifts that have been mm -hmm. given, it has a list of of uh, miraculous gifts uh, that people are able to do uh, from the Holy Spirit, but it ha has a list of non miraculous, and in, in the non miraculous is is teaching. Mm -hmm. And so it is a gift given by the Holy Spirit, but it's a non-miraculous gift. Not everybody has that and can do that right. to that effect. That's what Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12 is talking about. But here it's just talking about you, you need to have grown to the point to where you have enough knowledge mm -hmm. that you can teach someone, and especially in an individual way like what Henry's talking about. Yeah, don't People be get confused babe. about that like in the church thinking that everybody, if you've grown to a certain point, you should be up there teaching. It's not right. talking about that. No, it's not. It, it's just being able to teach someone right. or have the knowledge to be able to teach someone. It, that, that's the growth part there that it's talking about here. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 14. Uh, this, this is more, Mark, is this not more the uh, miracle type side of it, the and Ephesians 4. 
He's not listening to me. Is this not more of the miracle part of Ephesians chapter 4? 11 through 14. And he said, And he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And it's for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man or a full grown or mature uh, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Gift. Yeah, that's going to be a big point of mine here in a little bit. You're going to see why he says don't be many teachers. I mean, here we're going to see what we're looking at pretty much is the idea that, man, we, we need teachers and we need you know, those in this office, like Scott was pointing out a while ago, you you need to have someone that can be, uh, that was that's willing to stand up here and do this, but at the same time, you need to uh, understand that, it, that it's pretty serious when you stand up here in, in front of people and uh, do this. So here he says, he himself gave, the apostles and prophets, evangelists, and pastors, and teachers. And the reason why he gave them is for the equipping of the saints. And you got to remember at this time that the Word of God was not complete. We didn't have a Bible. You couldn't turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 11 through 14 at that time. So here you need, you need people. They needed people to go around to different churches and to read these letters and to teach. And so, um, but again, when you look back and you're going to see in just a minute where there's no, uh, he, he says right here, my brethren, not, not many of you become teachers. Why? Knowing that we receive a, a stricter judgment. But, you can see the importance of teachers and really all these offices there that is mentioned here. There's an importance of them. They were needed. But so when you look think about that, why does James say don't be many of your teachers? And what what is another word for teacher? Okay. What it, what did uh Nicodemus called Jesus when he appeared to him. Rabbi. Rabbi. This is kind of the meaning here. Rabbi, uh, master, teacher. All of all of these things are part of this because, and, and the reason why we say this is because the teacher at that time was kind of like a, was called a master. And lowered and different things like this because he was over the disciples that he was teaching. And so that you can see that was a great uh, bit of responsibility. But along with that, and we're going to see just here in just a second, along with that is a lot of prestige and a lot of, a lot of power a lot of recognition, a lot of authority. People respected those teachers. They treated them special. And they got all this publicity and everything. So if that's the reason why you're going to do it, if that's your motivational factor behind being a teacher like maybe some of these were, 
because of what the the recognition and everything get, then then you need you don't need to do this. Uh, and we're kind of going to look at that. And it's Matthew chapter twenty three and verses one through ten. And uh, well. All right, come on now. All right, get me to Matthew. <laughs> That's... Well, all right. I know Matthew 23 is in there. <laughs> well, somebody turn to Matthew 23. And read verses 1 through 10. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets in the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. All right, you see, you can see from that that there was all this, you know, when they go into the marketplaces and they go have these places, all, they were just, I mean, people were just giving them recognition. They were uh, looking up at them, and they would, you know, give them respect. And that's what they wanted. They, they would uh, make their tassels longer. They would do all kinds of things to get noticed so that they could be called a rabbi. They wanted to be called a, a teacher. They wanted to be called uh, somebody special and looked at like they're somebody special. And Jesus said, listen to what they say and observe it. Do what they say, but don't look at them. Don't watch them. Because if you're watching them and you look at them and you see what they're, t they, don't, they don't equal with what they're teaching and preaching. They're, they're telling you don't do this or don't do that, and they're correct, but they're doing it. And so that was part of the problem here that James is saying, don't be somebody that you, don't be a teacher for the recognition part. Don't go in here and start, uh, you know, just for that, when you get to these feasts or in the marketplace, that's, you know, you get, hear people go, there's a rabbi, there's a teacher, and man, look how, that's how much respect we can give to him. And, and at the same time, the only problem is you, you, you can't hear them. You don't want to listen to them because what they teach, they don't preach. They don't do it. They teach something, but they don't do what they teach. They preach things, and you know, they don't uh, you know, do what they preach. So it's important, you know, if Mark was a preacher's kid, <laughs> well, you call it a PK, and a, and a and elders, when they have you know when they're children and stuff, what why does preacher's kid always doomed to be the worst? And why does an elder's kid always seem to be the worst? I mean. And that's that's my home. And and that's my that was my whole 
That's my whole point is because when you are a, when you are a preacher's child or an elder's child or a preacher or a teacher or anything else, guess what? You're going to get scrutinized. And that was the big difference. They, you know, normal everyday people go to maybe movies and then you have even a church member there at the movies, but if they saw you there and they didn't think you ought to be there even though they're there, it's because they look at us, you know, different. And you know that. And if, if to become a teacher or a preacher or somebody that's always up front, you have to be real careful and try to live out to the best of your ability of what you teach. You, if you stand up here and you're going to speak on uh, tongues and controlling your tongue and then you're cussing all over the place to everybody around about you, then uh, you, don't, you don't need to be a teacher. And that's, that's James's point here is they were doing this for the purpose of being recognized and having that power. They, they had disciples and they had people that they were over and they were teaching over if you were a teacher. Therefore, that, you know, they're uh, uh, lording over them and that was a special for them. They got big head, you know, sort of Scott. You know, getting to Bible school teachers, and I'm not talking the adult area, but over the classes, which, which I'm over, one thing, and I took this from Lamar years and years and years ago, one thing that Lamar told me was know your teachers. Um, you know, you don't want somebody that just, say, came here a week or two ago and put them in a, in a teaching position because you really don't know them that well. You really don't know what level they're at. You know, you don't know their abilities or capabilities you know, if, if you kind of know your teachers and know who they are, know their background, uh, you, need to, you need to lean on that, on your knowledge of them and, and develop that, that uh, what, what's the word I'm looking at? Trust. Trust and, uh, you know, you, you need Report. to develop trust in, in those people and you need to get to know them because, again, you know, you don't want the wrong things going on in, the, in those classrooms because when those doors shut, you really don't see. And so you gotta be careful. Yeah. And uh, sometimes people may be going through a time in their life where they're stressed and things are going on. They might even actually be, you know, removed from teaching for a while till they get things sorted out. Mm -hmm. A lot of things you gotta look at, but you gotta be careful. And obviously they have to have the knowledge in the background and the, the Bible knowledge to know what they're doing and how they work with, with kids. So there's, there's just a lot of things you got to look for. Yeah, it's, it's a, the thing about it is it's such a big responsibility. I mean, it, it is, when, when you're teaching in the prisons and, and you're, you're in the pulpits and you're in front of people, I mean, the last thing you want to do, and like Rick and Richard and myself, when we are at Summer Manor, we teach. It it is so vital, especially when you're talking about people that's of different denomination. I I shouldn't say especially because that's not true, but it, it's it's so important that you just teach Bible, and that you just teach the Word of God. And if people get offended, then you, you can't help that. I mean, you, you just teach what's truth. And there's those who has left, especially at Summer Manor, because, you know, you just got to teach the truth. And sometimes that truth offends people. But you got to make sure you're teaching the truth and do it out of love. Uh, Night. You know, the Bible says we contend for the faith that was delivered mm -hmm. and study to show yourself approved. And you, 
and you got in that situation before class Thursday night and because you had to contend for the truth but you wanted to do it in such a way that that you didn't say I, I think this or I think that but you 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 contended for the faith out there by quoting scripture you know yeah and, you? and that's what a child of God needs to do and they contend for the faith but it's got to know what to what the faith is and he's got to be walking according to to what uh, what the Lord Jesus Christ left for us to do yeah that particular one was one of the people that had left because they said that we said that, that we we're the only ones going to heaven I said I have never heard anybody in, in that talk that said that 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 way church of Christ is the only one going to heaven I but I did say, tell her, I did tell this particular person, I said, but if you can get a name on the building out of your mind and, and just think about what God, what is Christ going to do? He's going to present that his church to God without spot, without blemish. Whose church is that? It's his church. So we're not talking about what's on our name on our building. But you better be a member of his church when when this life is over. And that I'm like I said, that's not saying don't you don't necessarily just because it says Church of Christ on the front of a building, but you better be a member of Christ's church. Because if you're not, that's who's gonna present it that church to God. Um, uh, Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 24. It says, Indeed you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know His will, and approve the things that are excellent, be instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, and an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the former knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who says do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Here, here again, it's don't be many teachers because if you're going to teach, don't steal. Do not steal, then don't steal. And if you're going to teach and preach, do not have adultery, then don't create adultery. And those are things that you can't do. You can't teach and then do something totally opposite of, of what you're teaching. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 through 11. Uh, someone read that. I'm <clears throat> getting hoarse. All right, don't let everybody volunteer at one time. <laughs> It's First Timothy chapter one, verses seven through eleven. Excuse me. Uh, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves and, and mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And then here again is that idea, according to the teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. You're going to be a teacher, and you, 
don't have no idea what you're teaching or why or how come you're, you're not, you don't have no knowledge at all. Why do you want to be a teacher? And again, this just goes back to they wanted recognition. They wanted that power. They wanted that authority. They wanted to be called, there's a rabbi in, in the audits out here and in the marketplace, and they wanted to wear these long robes. They wanted all that attention that they could get. That they could get. We need teachers. And there's a point in time where you ought to be able to teach. Now, you may not do it, like I said, up here, but there is a point in time where you need to be t teachers. But these, they just love that mastering over their disciples and, you know, having that authority and having that par priority and having that recognition in the marketplaces and things like that. And But they didn't know what to teach. They, they, didn't, have no, they didn't have no knowledge. They didn't understand the law. They didn't know what they were talking about, and yet they they still were teachers. And James saying, you don't need to be a teacher if you don't know. It's, it's kind of like, Ronnie, when you're, when you're working for the Lord and you're doing good deeds, you're visiting, you're, you're preparing food and all that, um, you're doing that to glorify God, to show the, the, the goodness in you from God. You're not doing that to make yourself look good. Like, right. look what I did, you know, or I gave this much, or right. I did this and that. It's not for your publicity you're working through god you know, mm -hmm. god gets the glory of this it's through you you are the hands and feet and that's the attitude you have to have otherwise if it's for your to make you look good you know look what i did right. that's wrong that's the wrong attitude yeah that's what I, I think that's what james is doing here is saying don't let your motivation be recognition don't let your motivation be you know, just to say I'm a teacher, and I guess I better quit before I get kicked out. <laughs>